Welcome to this fourth and final session uh, on the Lord's Prayer as it's presented in the ACNA Catechism. We're going to conclude in this session by looking at the sixth and seventh petitions of the Lord's Prayer, and then we're going to briefly consider the section of the Catechism that has to do with developing a rule of prayer. But before we do that, let's pray. The Lord be with you. O oh, Almighty God, you pour out on all who desire it the spirit of grace and supplication. Deliver us when we draw near to you from coldness of heart and wanderings of mind, that with steadfast thoughts and kindled affections we may worship you in spirit and in truth. Through Jesus Christ our Lord. Amen. Well, the um, sixth petition is... Um, lead us not into temptation. Um, question 204 in the Catechism summarizes the meaning of this petition like this. I am tempted by the false promises of the world, the selfish desires of my flesh, and the lies of the devil, all of which war against God and my spiritual well-being. Let's take a look at the meaning of temptation. When we talk about temptation, what what are we talking about? Question 203 in the Catechism talks about temptation like this. It says that temptation is an enticement, an enticement to turn away from the faith, to turn away from trust in God, and to violate his will or commandment. So I think it's important that we recognize here that temptation will always approach us or all, will always appear to us as something enticing or good. And that's, I think, a really important thing to remember. There are three sources of temptation that are outlined here, and we want to take a look briefly at each one of them. The first source of temptation comes from the world around us, which can dangle enticing things in front of us things that are probably not good to do or to have or to think or not good ways to act. So we face temptation from the culture and world around us. The second source of temptation is our own distorted desires. That as sin distorts our desires, it makes us desire the wrong things in the wrong way. And therefore, our own desires can become a source of temptation we can actually want things that are actually harmful for us. And the third source of temptation is a supernatural source of temptation, and that's the devil who hates us and who wants to undermine our spiritual lives. Now, this is a way of saying that temptation is going to come at us from all sides, from our culture, from our own desires, from the devil, and therefore... The catechism here is helping, wanting us to see this. There are, going to be, there are going to be moments for all of us when we're going to experience our lives as Christians as a struggle, a kind of a battle. Um, as a matter of fact, there's a famous book that was written um, in the early part of the 20th century that's simply called Spiritual Combat that actually deals with the subject of temptation. I think that's a good title, Spiritual Combat. We can't deal with temptations apart from God's grace. Uh, that's an important thing. When we pray this petition, lead us not into temptation, what we're acknowledging is we're acknowledging our vulnerability to temptation. And we're acknowledging our continuous dependence upon God to help us deal with that vulnerability. St. Thomas Aquinas um, said wisely, I think, that we're not praying here that we be shielded from every temptation because temptation is going to come to each of us because we're all sinners. What we're praying for here is, is that God not allow us to be drawn into temptation. And there's a reason for that. St. Thomas points out that the practice of of resisting temptation actually can increase our spiritual strength in the same way that exercise 
increases muscular strength. That is, the, the more we're able to resist temptation, the stronger spiritually we grow, just as the more heavy weights we lift, the more our bodily muscles grow. So we're not praying that we be spared all temptation whatsoever. We're praying that God won't allow us to be sort of sucked in to temptation. That's what we're praying for. Now the Catechism reminds us in question 206 that God never tempts anyone, but God does allow us to be tested so that our faith can mature and our spiritual strength can grow. That is, that we can grow in both faith and obedience. Now, there are several things that we can do to help us in times of temptation. One of the things that's really important is each one of us has to come to an awareness of those things which tempt us. That is, all of us are going to be tempted by different things. And we need to become aware of those things which are particularly tempting to us so that we can try to avoid them. The Catechism offers in question 208 some things that we can do to help us in times of temptation. The first thing, of course, is to pray for strength. And of course, that's what we're wording every time we pray the Lord's Prayer. Lead us not into temptation. Give us the strength to resist temptation. Another thing we can do is to regularly confess our own sins to God so that we're aware of them and that we ask God's forgiveness for them. Another way that we can resist temptation is to be consistent and devoted readers of Scripture so that we're open in heart and mind to the Word of God speaking to us. And finally, another way that we can resist temptation is to live accountable lives. It is to live accountably with other Christians. And when we find ourselves in moments of temptation or difficulty to go to a Christian friend and say, you know what, I'm struggling with this. Can you help me? Those are things that we will need to do to resist temptation. In Matthew 5, 29 to 30, Jesus says something interesting about temptation. And he, it's, he's obviously using hyperbole. And he says, well, you know, if your eye caused you to sin, gouge it out. If your hand caused you to sin, cut it off and throw it away. Obviously, he is being, he's speaking hyperbole. Right? Jesus is not expecting us to gouge out our eyes or cut our hands off. But what he is suggesting is this, that in some cases, resisting temptation is going to feel like gouging an eye out or cutting a hand off. In some cases, resisting temptation is going to feel something akin to death. But of course, it will actually be the path to life. So Jesus is alerting us that sometimes there are going to be moments where resisting temptation is going to be awfully, awfully, awfully difficult. Um, Romano Giardini reminds us of something that I think is really important. He says that when we pray, lead us not into temptation, what we're doing is we're acknowledging to ourselves that temptation can happen to any of us. None of us is immune to temptation. It will come to all of us. And those people who are most in danger are those who somehow believe that they are beyond temptation. Here's what Giardini says. It can happen to anyone, and it can happen again and again that the multifarious distractions and allurements of life, which no foresight can guard us against, may turn the possibility of sin into urgent danger, and from that into fierce temptation. And so the prayer leads deliver us from it. That is, what we're doing is we're asking God, by his grace, in those moments where we're tempted, to deliver us and to enable us to resist. Well, the seventh and final petition of the Lord's Prayer is actually quite similar to deliver us from temptation, and that is deliver us from evil. So deliver us from temptation and also deliver us from evil. Question 217 summarizes the meaning of the seventh petition like this. 
God has triumphed over all the powers of evil through the death, resurrection, and ascension of his Son, Jesus Christ. God will finally destroy all evil, including death, at the end of the age. Let's think about evil for a minute. Most of us, of course, are aware of evil from you know, movies and TV where there are evil characters or evil powers, and, and sometimes you know, we kind of watch them and we don't take them all that seriously. But the Catechism reminds us that evil is the deliberate rejection of God's good order of creation, a rejection which harms those who choose to reject it and also leads them to then engage in actions which harm other people. So notice what, notice what evil is. Evil is the deliberate rejection of God's intention and purposes for creation, for us. And in choosing to do that, the person who chooses evil not only harms themselves, they then go on to harm others, both physically and spiritually as well. And we have two forms of rebellion that we need to talk about. First of all, we wanna ask ourselves, well, you know, why is there evil in the world? Well, it's not because there's somehow something defective about creation. There's nothing, there's nothing inherently evil about creation. As a matter of fact, we know from the first chapter of Genesis that after God creates, he pronounces everything good, and not just good, but very good. So if that's the case, where does evil come from? Well, I think that we can say this. Evil, evil comes from two types of wills. Evil comes from human wills, which rebel against God's purposes. And evil comes from supernatural wills, that is the wills of fallen angels, who also rebel against God's purposes. So evil is created by both supernatural wills and by human wills who reject God's order and reject God's purposes for creation. One of the things, one of the things that this helps us to see, right, is that part of what it means to be free creatures is we actually have the freedom to refuse God's purposes. As awful as that is, it is something that we can do. All of course, all this of course raises the question, well, why does God allow evil? Um, question 211 in the Catechism offers an answer toward that or as much as an answer as I think can be given. Basically what it says is this, that God only allows evil because he is able to bring good from it. God only allows evil in the sense that he can bring good from it. Let's think of something very particular because uh, that's something of an abstract statement. Think about the most evil thing possible. Uh, and that of course certainly would be the death of the son of God on the cross. Jesus is the incarnate word of God. He's totally innocent. He's the source of goodness. And yet he is rejected by the human race. He's put to a shameful death. He dies on the cross in agony. And God uses that evil act to bring about good in Jesus' resurrection and ascension. So God allows evil to occur only because he's able to bring good out of it. One of the problems with evil is, is that evil has the tendency to weaken our ability to distinguish between good and evil. That is, once we start walking down the path of evil, once we start walking in the path of temptation, what we find is, is that our moral sensibilities start to be darkened. And it becomes more and more possible for us to do things that we probably at one point would recognize as wrong. That is, evil has the capacity to increasingly darken our conscience and blind us to the evil and harm that we're doing. And we only need to look at human history to find numerous examples of how that process works. 
Another thing we want to be mindful of here is that evil rarely presents itself as evil. Evil will always present itself to us as something that's very good, something very desirable. That is, if you think about some of the really evil figures in history, right? They have rarely come before people and say, hey, you know what? I'm a really evil person and I want to incite you to do evil and awful things. Don't you want to join me? It doesn't work like that. In his book, The Screwtape Letters, which is a series of letters written by a senior devil to a junior devil, there's one letter in which the senior devil rebukes the junior devil for wanting to provoke the young man that he's working on to kind of awful, immoral actions. And this is what the senior devil says. Like all young tempters, you are anxious to be able to report spectacular wickedness. But do remember, the only thing that matters is the extent to which you separate the man from the enemy that is God. It doesn't matter how small the sins are, provided their cumulative effect is to edge the man away from the light and out into the nothing. Murder is no better than cards, if cards will do the trick. Indeed, the safest road to hell is the gradual one, the gentle slope, soft underfoot, without turnings, without milestones, without signposts. That is, what what the senior devil is saying here is, he's saying, that actually the the best road to hell, the best road to evil, is a sort of the gradual, gentle slope that gradually heads downward so that no one really recognizes what's actually happening, and therefore no one can repent and turn. The good news here is that through Jesus' death and resurrection and the coming of the Holy Spirit, God not only has defeated the power of evil, but he has broken its hold over us. That is what God does through his grace, through the work of Christ and through the work of the Holy Spirit is he breaks the hold of evil on us and he enables us to recognize evil as evil and to hate it accordingly. One of the most important effects of grace is that it leads us to genuinely love the good and to genuinely hate that which is evil and to turn ourselves from it. So we haven't been left to fight or struggle against evil all alone. Once again, an important insight from Romano Giardini on this petition, deliver us from evil. It is the deepest layer of Christian consciousness that calls out here, the layer that knows that the world cannot be patched up, that it cannot, by positive thinking, be turned to the good. Too much of unthinkable magnitude has happened, and Giardini was writing this in the, in the immediate after effect of the Second World War. What God has staked against it is the full measure of his love. The immeasurable catastrophe of sin, the frightful chain of wickedness and evil that runs through history, after man individually and generically has done his utmost to defeat it, the realization breaks through that only God can truly do something about it. And the longing swells for the coming of that which can, that which can only turn all things to the good, but also that which leads to the new, the end of time, which is the breakthrough of the eternal, that is, the kingdom of God. The more we recognize the power of evil and the more we recognize its effects on our lives, the more we come to desire the coming of God's kingdom. Now the Lord's Prayer ends in in what's called a doxology or an act of praise and we all know what it is. For yours is the kingdom and the power and the glory forever. There's an important point to be made here, and that is this. All true prayer should lead us to doxology. All true prayer should lead us to the praise of God. The practice of a genuine and deep prayer life should should bear the fruit 
of leading us to continually praise and glorify God. And then finally, at the end of the prayer, we say this interesting word, this word, amen, which simply means, so be it. That is, we conclude the prayer by in effect saying, yes, that's right, I hope things end up like this. Yes, may the kingdom of God come. Yes, may his will be done on earth as it is in heaven. Yes, may his kingdom come and bring justice to the world. Yes, may, may his kingdom come and bring us bread, both spiritual and physical. Yes, may God's kingdom come and deliver us from temptation. Yes, may God's kingdom come and destroy and free us from all evil. Amen. Now, this section of the Catechism concludes with um, an important um, series of questions about the rule of prayer. So I want to say something briefly about that. There's an important recognition here, something that all of us really need to acknowledge, I think. And that is that as sinners, prayer doesn't come naturally to us. And as sinners, worship doesn't come naturally to us either. We, we often find both prayer and worship to be difficult, sometimes to be dull, sometimes to be without fruit, sometimes to kind of leave us with a sort of, sort of a dead sense. And I think the thing to say about that is, it's not that there's something wrong with prayer or worship, but there is something wrong with us. As sinners, we don't pray or worship naturally, and we don't naturally find prayer or worship enticing or exciting. And that's why it's important for each one of us to develop a rule of prayer, a regular pattern of prayer that we practice whether we really want to or not. Think about this in, uh, in an analogy with an exercise routine. Let's say you're just beginning a new exercise routine, right? And you, you wake up one morning and you're kind of feeling stiff and tired. And you say, well, you know what? I, I really don't feel like exercising now. I'll, I'll, I'll pick it back up tomorrow. And then tomorrow comes and you're still feeling maybe a little lazy. You say, well, I don't feel like exercising now. I, I think I'll pick it back up tomorrow. Well, clearly, right, you can see where this is going, right? Your, your exercise routine is about to go out the window. And the same is true with prayer and also with worship it requires discipline. With an Anglicanism, the historic rule of prayer for all people has been this. Being part of your church's Eucharist on Sunday, sharing in the daily office morning prayer and evening prayer in the prayer book, and practicing some form of private devotion. So the basic sort of rule of prayer is we're participating with our parish's worship on Sunday. We're engaging in morning and evening prayer, either privately or with other people. And we're sustaining a disciplined prayer life on our own, which could involve the reading of scripture or other things as well. And I think it's important to recognize that there are several dimensions of prayer. Most of us, when we think about prayer, the most common form of prayer that we'll think of is petitionary prayer. That is, prayers where we're asking for something. But prayer is really goes way beyond that. So let me just highlight a few dimensions of prayer that are held up in the catechism and say a word about each one. One really important dimension of prayer is praise. I just said a moment ago that true prayer should lead us to doxology, to the praise of God. And that's true. That is, praise, right, is where we simply acknowledge God's glory and almightiness and holiness. So praise needs to be part of our daily prayer diet. At some point in our prayers, we should seek to praise and glorify God. Another form of prayer is petition. And petition actually refers to when we're asking for things for ourselves. That's perfectly appropriate. It's certainly present in the Lord's Prayer. Give me strength for this day. Please help me to deal with this situation. Um, it's perfectly fine to ask for petitions where we're addressing our own needs. Another form of prayer is intercession. Intercession means that we're praying for someone else. 
that might be an individual or a group of people or um, the government or whatever, but intercessory prayer is an essential part of daily prayer. If we're only praying for ourselves and our own needs, we have an imbalanced prayer life. And then the form of prayer, which we've mentioned already before, is confession, where we come to that moment where we enumerate before God the ways in which we have offended against his holiness and asked his forgiveness. And finally, a final form of prayer, and that is thanksgiving. All our life of prayer should involve offering thanks to God. It's not coincidental that the church's central act of worship, the Eucharist, derives its name simply from a Greek word that means thanksgiving. So literally in the church, every time we celebrate the Eucharist, it's Thanksgiving Day because we're giving thanks to God for all that he has done on our behalf. This is one of the things that actually the liturgy of the church in the Book of Common Prayer allows us to do it contains all those forms of prayer. That is, if you, if, you, if you carefully think about what you're doing every Sunday with the Book of Common Prayer, you'll notice that all those forms of prayer are present. Praise, thanksgiving, confession, intercession, petition. All those things are all present. And so the prayer book is actually schooling us to develop a balanced prayer life that we can then take home with us. Question 246 of the Catechism um, reflects upon the purpose of the church's liturgy, and I'll conclude with this. It says, the, the, the question 246 says, that historically the, the liturgy of the church has served one really important purpose, and that is, it enables us to worship God joyfully with one voice. It enables us to worship God joyfully with one voice. Those, each one of those things are important. So I know that probably there may be some Sundays in which for you, you come to church and you're not probably in like the best of moods. Maybe you're tired, maybe you've had a bad week. One of the things that the liturgy can do for us at those moments is it can actually lift us out of that mood or of that sensibility and place us in God's presence and therefore allow us to worship joyfully. It also enables us to worship with one voice because what the liturgy does is it unites us as individuals into a common body, into Christ's body, so that we can praise God together. I hope you'll think seriously about developing a rule of prayer. I hope that you'll think seriously about your own prayer practices. And I hope that by looking at the catechism, you'll be stimulated with a desire to develop a deeper life of prayer and a deeper life of worship.